All right, turning your Bibles to the book of Acts, if you would please this morning. The book of Acts. We got a little bit of feedback, not too bad. Stay away from this one over here. All right, so I have, I'm learning as I go. Turning your Bibles to the book of Acts. Also remember a few people in prayers. Miss Helen Anthony wanted me to let everybody know thank you for all the prayers uh, from everyone. She's been in the hospital and had to go to urgent care the other night. And so she's been going through quite a bit. So just continue to remember Miss Helen Anthony uh, in your prayers. And also all those who are at home that could not come out today uh, due to uh, underlying health conditions. And just be in prayer for all of those uh, as we go through the coming weeks. Chapter 1 of the book of Acts. Chapter 1. And we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 8. And I know you cannot stand up, and I know how much you love to stand up, but God knows our hearts. So read with me, if you would, chapter 1 of the book of Acts, and we're going to be in verse 1 through 8. The Word of God says this, The former treaties I have made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, have given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart far from Jerusalem, but saith he, Wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence, or not long from now. When they therefore were came together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will that at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. This is the Word of God. Let us pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we come to you this morning on what seems to be a little bit of a dreary day, but oh, hallelujah, praise God, it's a glorious day. Any day is a glorious day that we get to praise and worship you. And Lord God, we're trying to do the best we can, Lord, with the circumstances and situations that we find ourselves in. And Lord God, I would ask you to just touch each and every individual in this state and in this country and in this world who has contracted this coronavirus. Lord God, go by their bedsides, Father. But Lord God, I want you to get the glory. I want healing to take place, but we want you to get the glory. We want people to see that you are in control of all things and that this virus did not catch you by surprise. And Father, I thank you for allowing us to come in here behind your house today, Lord, and to worship in this manner. Lord God, the, the best way that we can, Lord, it's so good to see faces even though we can't shake hands and we can't hug and we can't let the kids run around and just, you know, hug on everybody and play. But, oh, Father God, it's so good to just be here at your house. Father, we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And as I want to say once again, what I normally say is, if you're glad to be behind God's house, say amen. And so lights and, lights and, and horns are going off. If we can't be in God's house, we can be behind God's house. But the thing we always need to remember is that we, every individual in these cars here today that are saved by the blood of the Lamb, we are the church of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. All right. So once we have seen what we saw here in the book of Acts, what now? We might ask ourselves this question. What do we do now? Right? We, we've had Easter we, we've, we've celebrated the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe that He has risen from the grave. We believe that He sits at the right hand of the Father on high to ever make intercessory for us. So, what do we do now? Now that Easter is over, what now? 
Now that we have experienced all this, what now? Do we believe? Do we believe? Do we believe what we have been hearing? Do we believe in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ? If you're saved by the blood of the Lamb here this morning, I know you do, and I hope so as well. So what now? Well, here in our text, we see Luke explaining to Theophilus something. And we want to see who Theophilus is. In, in the original language, it means lover of God. Uh, some scholars believe that this could be a possible Roman official, someone like that. But we're going to see it as being a Christian, someone who is a lover of God. Luke is explaining to Theophilus that this, write this down. The burden of proof has been met. Amen? The burden of proof has been met. We, we celebrated Easter last week. We celebrated Palm Sunday the week before. So we're looking at what now? What do we do? We believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We believe that he went through the east gate there in Jerusalem and fulfilled prophecy. Amen? So what now? The burden of proof has been met. Look with me again real quickly at verses 1 through 3. It says, The former treaties, and I want us to understand what that means. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion or his death by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to to the kingdom of God. So the burden of proof has been met. He says this. He says, I wrote the first narrative or the first treaty or the first book, which was the gospel of Luke. The book of Luke dealt with Jesus' birth. Hallelujah. It dealt with Jesus' ministry. It dealt with Jesus' miracles. It dealt with him being the fulfillment of prophecy. It dealt with his death, it dealt with his burial, and hallelujah to the Lamb of God, it dealt with his resurrection as well. Now in Luke 1, 1 through 4, we see that it was written to Theophilus, this Christian, right, this lover of God, written to Theophilus as proof and as an apologetic account as to why he should believe the things that he has been instructed in. The burden of proof, dear ones, has been met. The burden of proof has been met. The book of Luke, he says, I wrote this, right, to let you know to believe in the things that you have been instructed in. We know this today, that we believe in the Word of God. We believe in the Holy Bible of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we believe in the things that this book instructs us in. Can I get an amen? Amen. We believe in these things. Now, in verse 3, Luke goes on to speak of how Jesus gave even more proof of who he was after his passion, after his death, and after his suffering. He presented himself alive at the tomb. He presented himself on the road to Emmaus. He presented himself in the upper room. And he even presented himself to the 500 that Paul explains to us in the book of Colossians. The burden of proof has been met. Jesus Christ is who he says he is. Amen? Now, in verse 2b, Luke explains that after this, Jesus instructs them of what to do next. What now? Instructs them of what to do next. And he does so through the power of the Holy Spirit. You'll see that in verse 2. He says, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, it is my observation, and you take this as you will. It is my observation that if the Lord Jesus Christ turns to the Holy Ghost of God, to the Holy Spirit, for power in his ministry, how much more do we need the Holy Spirit so we can have effectiveness in our own lives and in our own ministry. How much more do we need to call on the power of the Holy Ghost of God in our own lives? Too many Christians are trying to live by their own power when we never ever were intended to do so, not once we were saved, not once we were sealed, 
by the Holy Ghost of God, we were to call on that Holy Spirit in order to have power. And these were the things that he was being instructed in and was being so through the power of the Spirit. Now that's just my observation. Luke goes on to explain Jesus' instructions showing how important the Holy Spirit is to the believer. Look with me at verse 4 and 5 real quickly. The Word of God says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. Wait for the promise of the Father which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days from now. So he said for him to wait on this promise. Jesus explains and gives these instructions showing how important the Holy Spirit is to the believer. Good things, dear ones, and I want you to listen to this. He tells them to wait on this promise. Good things come to those who wait. The Holy Spirit is the focal point of what Luke and Jesus are trying to explain. Not only to Theophilus, hallelujah, but to us as well. He's trying to explain good things are going to come to those who wait. You go wait on the Holy Spirit to come upon you because I have plans. And so we too in our own lives need to understand how how great it is to wait on that power. Wait before we take certain initiatives to do certain things. We as Christians have the Spirit living in us, but we need to be patient and wait on Him to lead God and direct our every step. One of the biggest problems we have, and I think it's because of this great disconnect that we see as Christians, if we do not wait on the Holy Spirit of God to give us direction in all things that we do, we think that maybe He's only for the big things. Maybe it's only when somebody has cancer. Maybe it's only when, when, when there's somebody in the family who has went down the wrong path and there's nothing else we can do. Then we need the Holy Spirit of God. But that's not the case. We need the Holy Spirit in our lives to call upon that power in all that we do to lead God and direct us in every decision that we ever make. We need that power in our lives. We have the power. The day that we accepted the Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit came to reside inside of us, we had that power, but many Christians never call upon it. We don't wait patiently and let the Holy Spirit show us what the right answer for things are. We need to allow Him to lead God and direct our every move. But look what happens here real quickly in verse 6. In verse 6, the Word of God says this, When they therefore were come together, they asked of Him, saying, Lord, will Thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And I want you to see this. And maybe you'll read it again later on when you get home. I want you to see this. The disciples interrupt Jesus during His instructions on the Holy Spirit. They interrupt Him. He is telling them to go and wait on the promise that's going to come. And it's going to be great. It's a promise that Jesus Christ himself has given. But then they change the subject and start to, hey, are you going to bring your kingdom now? Are we going to rule and reign? Are we going to be sitting by your side? We're ready to lay waste to some people. They were looking at their fleshly needs, which leads to my next point. Write this down. Quit interrupting him. Quit interrupting Jesus. Quit interrupting the Holy Spirit in your life. In verse 6, it seems that the disciples are far more focused on ruling and reigning with Jesus more than they were waiting on the promise. Now, how many of us here are the same way? We're more worried about what we want, the things that we want in our life, more so than we are waiting on the Holy Spirit of God to show up, show out, and to lead, guide, and direct 
and the ways that we need to go. This sounds like a lot of Christians today. We try to treat Jesus like a genie in a bottle, always wanting what we want and not willing to wait and learn and listen to what Jesus is telling us. We have a, a big problem as Christians when it comes to listening. One of, the, one of the biggest problems I believe that we have is listening because in order to listen, you have to stand still long enough to hear him talk to you. You have to stay still long enough to hear him, hear his voice in your heart and on your mind. And we don't want to do that. We have plans. We got things we want to do. God needs to get on our time. God needs to catch up with what I'm doing. But that's not the way it works, Christian. We need to learn to wait and listen to the Word of God in our lives. Jesus was explaining to them that the Holy Spirit is what you must have to be obedient to me and to carry out my purpose. But they were more worried about their own fleshly concerns. They were more worried about, is the kingdom going to come right now? We're ready. We're ready to do all these things. We're ready to rule and reign. He says, listen, I, I've got a promise for you. You need to go and wait. You need to go and listen. You need to go and obey. But dear ones, we don't like to do that, do we? We don't want to wait on God. We definitely don't want to listen to the Holy Spirit if He's going to tell us something different than what we want to do. We're not very good at obeying when it does not coincide with the things that we want to do. But instead, hallelujah, but instead of chastising them, which He could have easily done, He lovingly answers them here in verse 7. Look with me at verse 7. He says, and he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons when the Father hath put in his own power. He lovingly answers them. He pretty much tells them this, Quit worrying about when I'm coming back and the things that you have no control over. Quit worrying about all these things, about when I'm coming back. Oh, is it now? You come back now? Good, because I'm ready to go right now. He says, quit waiting. I, I have work for you to do. Quit worrying about the things that you have no control over. No power over. These things are in God's time. We think about the pandemic we're dealing with right now. Quit worrying about things that you have no control over. People are letting it ruin their lives. Most of the time because our faith is not anchored in the one who went to Calvary for us. Oh, we might be Christians. We might be saved by the blood of the Lamb. But are you anchored in your faith? Do you believe that He has this thing under control? We need to, as Christians, we need to understand that He does. But listen to this. He then gets them back on track. See, they, they get off track. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about waiting on a promise. He's talking about waiting on power. They start talking about they want it right now. He lovingly answers them without chastising them, really. And then he gets them back on track. Lastly, write this down. Jesus gets them back to the point. Jesus gets them back to the point. Look with me at verse 8 real quickly. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Jesus gets them back on track. Jesus brings them back to the main topic. He says the power of the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you from on high. That's the main point. The burden of proof has been met, right? He gets them back to the point of what they need to be doing after the resurrection. Theophilus was a believer 
as were the disciples. And he was telling them that the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost of God, is the main thing that you should be concerned with. Not when you're going to rule and reign. Not, not when I'm going to get back at whoever and the Romans and, and everybody they were mad at and whatever else was going on or whatever's going on in your life. And it's not about that. He was getting them back to the point of the Holy Spirit of God, bringing them back to the main thing. Why did he do this? Because he is the one that will give you the power to carry out his plan. He's the one. He's the one to give you the power to carry out his plan. What is his plan? We might ask ourselves. We, we think about these. So the burden of proof has been met. We've quit interrupting him. We're getting back to the point. We're doing all these things just so we can carry out God's plan. What is God's plan? Matthew 28, we see this in verse 8 of our text, but Matthew 28, 19 through 20 says this. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Isn't it a blessing how everything comes back to discipleship? Everything comes back to telling others about Jesus Christ. Telling a lost and dying world who Jesus Christ is. He says, you're going to need power from on high in order to carry out my plan. Wait for that. When you have that, then you have it all, baby. Then you have it all. Quit worrying about your own pride. Quit worrying about your own wants. Quit worrying about your own self-interest. And get on Jesus' page, which is to let the Holy Spirit of God that resides in the Christian to give you the power to go out and share to this lost and dying world that Jesus Christ is risen. Jesus Christ is alive. He is the reason that we do all things. It's crazy how everything comes back to discipleship, evangelism, telling people about Jesus. It's not, a, it's not about us, guys. It's never been about us. It's always been about Him. It's always been about the love of the Father. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. It's always been about Him. It's never been about us. He loved us, but He gave His only begotten Son to die on a cruel Roman cross so we can have everlasting life. And what we're supposed to do with that power that we're supposed to wait be patient for, listen to, let to lead God and direct our lives is to tell the world about who Jesus is. Dear ones, we are the continuation and the manifestation of our Lord and Savior's ministry here on earth. We all are, everyone in the cars, we have 60 cars out here this morning and families in each one of these cars Every one of you who is saved by the blood of the Lamb, every one of you who has accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior is a continuation and a manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ's ministry here on earth. The ministry that he did 2,000 years ago as he went out and told his disciples and instructed them as we see in the book of Acts where Luke is telling Theophilus the same thing. To believe in what you've been instructed in. And instruct others in the same thing. Instruct others who Jesus Christ is. Instruct others that he died, went to a tomb, rose again on the third day. And is now resurrected to heaven at the right hand of the Father on high. 
and tell a lost and dying world about that Jesus. So you might ask, as we close, you might ask, what now? What now, preacher? We've, we've talked about this. We know that Easter has passed. We've, we know all these things are going on. But what now? Well, if you're lost here this morning, and it's, listen, one of the things, and, and anybody watching our video here today, if you're lost, I want you to understand one thing perfectly clear, that every saved person on this planet was once lost too. They too were once lost and undone without a Savior. So if you're lost, what now? Understand that the burden of proof has been met. Jesus is who he said he is, and he has come, hallelujah, to give you everlasting life to all of those, all of those who will believe on him for their eternal salvation and accept him as Lord and Savior. That's what now for the lost person. The burden of proof has been met. Jesus Christ is who he says he is. And if you believe on him for your eternal salvation and accept him as Lord and Savior of your life, the Bible says you're saved. Now if you're saved here this morning, if you're one of the Christians here or watching, I want you to know this. I want you to quit interrupting. Quit interrupt what Jesus is trying to do in your life. Quit interrupt what the Holy Spirit is trying to guide, lead, and direct you into. He's trying to do what's best for you. But too many times we get in the way of what's best for us. He knows. Quit interrupting him. And realize this. It's not about you. It's about him. Realize that it's not about your wants. It's not about your desires. It's not about your 401ks. It's not about where your children go to college or their batting average in high school. It's about him. It's about Jesus. It's about the one who died on Calvary. It's also time that we do this. It's time that we get back to the point. That we get back to the point of why he saved us so we can tell the world who he is. So maybe we think about that today. Get back to the point of why he saved us so we can tell the world who he is. You know, it's great if you're saved here this morning, it's great that you're going to heaven. It is. It's the greatest gift of all time. If you're saved here this morning, it's great that you're going to heaven. But I got a question for you. How many people are you going to take with you? That's my challenge to you. I'm so glad that you're saved by the blood of the Lamb. I'm glad that you can rest in that salvation. But I want to challenge your heart that the Holy Spirit is, is squeezing right now. How many people are you going to take with you? How many people are you going to lead to salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ? Just like God blessed, somebody led you. And when you lead those people, I want you to love them. I want you to keep up with them. Dear ones, I want you to encourage everyone that you see out here this morning. I want you to go home and I want you to make phone calls all this week and say, you know what? I couldn't hug you today, but I love you. I can't wait till God clears all this up and we get to come back. Because I'll tell you what, I've got a brand new zeal for the work of God. And I can't wait. I can't wait till I can get back out and show Him what He's did in my life through this quarantine. There's things you want to do. Hopefully there's things you wish you had been doing and now you realize how bad you still want to do those things. 
and you're ready to go to them and you're ready to get back to them and you're ready to start afresh and God says, that's what I want to hear. And maybe, just maybe, with everything we're going through now, maybe it's for God's people to finally get off their padded barriers and their padded pews and go out and do the work that he saved you. Amen? Clap. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for this time you have given us. What a glorious day. But I wouldn't expect no different from a glorious God. Lord, help us as we go out and tell others about you. Father, we know that we're confined right now. But Lord, I would ask that you would use your Holy Spirit to just kindle that fire within every Christian here this morning. Lord God, they would have a new burning passion. Lord God, just fight that to be it to get out and tell people what you have done in their lives. To tell people how great it is to be saved by the blood of the Lamb. How great it is to have a Jesus that sticks closer to you than a brother. To have a Jesus that loves you enough to die for you. That they want to go out and tell the whole world who Jesus is, who you are. Lord God, I love you. I praise you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Until we see each other again, be listening for the call-outs. I love each and every one of you. I thank God for everyone that showed up, and I thank God for all those who couldn't be here this morning. Thank you so much. God bless, and until next time.